Hey there, my name is John Byers. I'm sort of famous. I'm actually on Wikipedia as the world's first blogger. That's because I started blogging about math and physics before it was cool. And I kept on blogging about it until after it was cool too. Um, nowadays, people don't pay much attention to blogs. It's hard to get anyone to read them. Apparently, people these days like to watch YouTube videos instead. So I'm going to start a YouTube channel. But I heard that to get people to pay attention to your YouTube channel so you can get a lot of subscribers and monetize it, you got to be controversial, especially in physics. So I'm planning to be controversial now. I'm going to take down some of the top physicists showing that these academic fat cats really aren't doing all that much. They sit around in their comfy tenured chairs, making up new particles that don't really explain anything. And also on the flip side, I'm gonna go after some of the wannabes who can't hack it in academia. We talk about their crazy theories of physics on their YouTube channels. No, just kidding. Actually, I got a job here at the University of Edinburgh where I'm supposed to be popularizing what they're doing in math and physics. So that's what I'll be doing. I'll be interviewing various people and also explaining stuff. No controversy, sorry. So, for example, I was just talking to Neil Turek, who's a physicist here, and the other day he told me that uh, neutrinos and gravitational waves are both responsible for making gold. So, how in the world can neutrinos and gravitational waves be responsible for gold? That's what I'll tell you about. Why is gold such a big deal in the first place? Why do people want gold? Well, of course, it's rare, but lots of elements are rare. So praseodymium is an element that's rare, but you've probably never even heard of it. So what's more important is that gold is both rare, but you can still find it in forms that where it's not a compound with anything else. You can find gold nuggets. That's one thing. But another thing is that it's shiny and beautiful and malleable and so on. All these other properties are part of it being a transition element. That's a kind of element like silver and so on. Near the bottom of the periodic table, they get to be pretty heavy. Near the top, they're like iron and they're more reactive and you never see an iron nugget. So iron's a practical metal, but it's not flashy like gold. So gold is heavy and unreactive. And that's part of why it's so cool. It has a lot of protons and neutrons in its nucleus. It has 79 protons, and the most common form has 118 neutrons. And that makes it almost near the radioactive elements. In fact, theoretically, all forms of gold are slightly radioactive. They're different isotopes. Isotopes means they have different numbers of nuclei in their nucleus. Um, but the most common one, the one I just mentioned, with 118 neutrons, is very stable in practice, but theoretically, it's slightly radioactive and it has an incredibly long half-life. So it would take much longer than the age of the universe for you to see it actually decay. So that's a cool thing about gold. Another thing, of course, is that it's gold, that is, it's golden. Why is it golden in color? Well, there's another element that's golden in color, it's called rubidium, but it's very chemically reactive. 
And so you never see it around by itself in nature. Gold is the only one that, that you can actually see lying around that's golden colored. And that's partially because it is near the bottom of the periodic table. It's very heavy. And that means that it actually takes special relativity to describe what it's doing. You see, in a hydrogen atom, uh, the electron's average velocity is about 1 over 137 times the speed of light. That number, 1 over 137, is called the fine structure constant. It's not exactly 1 over 137, but it's awfully close. Now, if you had an electron going around two protons, like a helium nucleus, it would go around twice as fast, and so on. Not in a linear relationship exactly, but pretty close. So we don't expect there could ever be a nucleus with 137 protons in it. That would be an electron going around at the speed of light, naively, and that's uh, too fast. But for gold, it's pretty darn fast. So it's only the electrons near this nucleus near the, that are going around really fast, but they're affected by special relativity, which kicks in for very fast moving objects. And apparently some complicated calculations show that that changes the look of gold and makes it look golden. So I read, now that's pretty complicated stuff. I can't do that kind of calculation by hand, so I can't really explain it to you, I'm afraid. And I think it's a little bit touchy, a little bit fishy to say that that's why things, why it looks like gold, because special relativity also affects a lot of other heavy elements and they don't look gold. So there's something special about gold going on, which not easy to figure out very quickly. You need a computer to do the simulation. But the other thing about gold is that it's rare. And so why is gold as rare as it is? Well, we've got to back up a second here. What makes gold in the first place? We used to think that gold was made in a supernova. Now in a type two supernova, what you've got is a big old red giant star that runs out of fuel and it explodes. First, it explodes from the inside and the shock wave takes a while to poke through. Here you see it poking through. It's called the shock breakout and then bang, it explodes and it gets the whole star blue hot and the whole star shoots out. Near the core of that supernova, a whole bunch of heavy elements are already present, as heavy as iron at least, but nuclear reactions cause them to collide, cause the nuclei to collide and fuse into even heavier elements like gold. So some gold is made that way. But more recently, people discovered that at least half of the gold is made a different way through colliding neutron stars. So a neutron star is actually what's left when you have a supernova. The core collapses and forms a big ball of neutrons with some elements like iron and so on at the crust. And you can have two neutron stars in a solar system. It's very rare, but you can have that. And they can orbit each other. And if they're close to each other, as they orbit, they can whip around really fast and so fast that they produce gravitational waves. They can actually bend the fabric of space in a significant way, thanks to general relativity, and they can make these ripples that spread outwards and carry out energy away from those stars. And that means they slowly spiral into each other and then eventually they collide sometimes. And when they collide, they form a kind of explosion that's a really intense event called a short gamma ray burst, I think. And in that process, a lot of the elements near the surface of the neutron star 
get zapped with a lot of neutrons that are coming out and they form heavier elements like gold. And so that's where we think a lot of the gold comes from. So that's pretty cool that you need to know general relativity to fully understand where gold came from. But the even cooler part, or the newer part, is that you need to think about neutrinos. So neutrinos are involved in lighter elements turning into heavier elements. You see, underlying that process that's called nuclear fusion, where two nuclei collide to form a bigger nucleus, is that protons are turning to neutrons because heavy elements have to have more neutrons in them. If they didn't have it, there'd be too many protons that the electric charge of the protons would make the nucleus fly apart. And so the way you can turn protons into neutrons is that a proton and an electron can collide and turn into a neutron. But it was discovered that also some very light, very hard to detect particle came out called an electron neutrino. That's this new sub E thing. New is a Greek letter there for neutrino. And eventually those neutrinos were experimentally detected. And so now we know that the electronness comes from the electron here and goes out in the electron neutrino. And so that whenever you do nuclear fusion, you're also making electron neutrinos. So that's happening when you're making heavier elements. But there's an interesting thing that happens when this kind of process is going on, the reverse process can also happen. Any process in nature, the reverse process is theoretically possible too. And in this case, if you have enough neutrinos around, like you do in these incredible explosions like supernovae or colliding uh, neutron stars, you can have the neutrons collide with the neutrinos and go back and turn into a proton and electron. So that reduces the amount of the manufacture of heavier elements like gold. So the first process can make the heavy elements like gold, but the second process tends to degrade them, turn them back into lighter elements. So it's a complicated business, but it turns out that you get more gold if there's some mechanism that stops this reverse process from happening. And what could stop it from happening? Well, one thing that could stop it from happening is that these electron neutrinos can turn into something else before they have a chance to engage in this reverse process. And that's where things get really interesting because there are actually three kinds of neutrinos besides the electron neutrino. There's also something called a muon neutrino and something called a tau neutrino. And so the tau neutrino isn't so important in this particular game here, but one thing that happens is that these neutrinos can turn into each other. This is a more recently discovered fact. So I talked about electronness going from the electron into the electron neutrino, but it turns out that things are trickier than that because electron neutrinos can turn into muon neutrinos and vice versa. They kind of oscillate back and forth between the two kinds, like water sloshing back and forth in a glass. And that's been detected because we've made electron neutrinos and then looked for them and found less than we expect and then checked to see if there are muon neutrinos around. And yes, they are. there are. So that's what's happened to them. So what happens in some of these events, like colliding neutron stars, is that we get new, uh, electron neutrinos turning into muon neutrinos before they can get rid of the neutrons and turn them back into protons. So that leads to an enhanced creation of gold and other elements. 
And in fact, in some of the computer simulations they've done, they find that it can actually increase the amount of gold created by up to a factor of 10. So you may wonder if this is all just theory. It's pretty far out stuff after all, but in fact, they've seen a pair of neutron stars collide and then looked at the visible light it produces and looked at its spectrum so you can see what elements are in there. And they've seen heavy elements, including gold. And we estimate that that explosion created a lot of gold, in fact, 10 times the mass of the moon in gold. That's a lot of gold. And so that gold and all the other stuff that gets shot out of those explosions eventually cools down, turns into cosmic dust, and then eventually forms new solar systems with new planets like ours. So if you have a golden ring, it came from some event like that. And so you can tell your friends, hey, see this ring? This came from colliding neutron stars thanks to gravitational radiation and the oscillation of neutrinos from electron neutrinos into muon neutrinos. So I'm gonna be talking about stuff like this on my channel here. Sometimes I'll talk about more advanced mathematical physics. Sometimes I'll talk about basic stuff, news, things like that. I'll also be interviewing various people at the University of Edinburgh and elsewhere. And I wanna actually avoid the controversy, which usually doesn't amount to much in the end, it's just entertainment, and try to teach you a little bit of actual physics, which is, I think, a lot more fun in the long run. Okay, see ya, bye.